This is SSN. Story Studio Network. Welcome to the Fatigue Fixer podcast. Ever wonder why it feels like the entire sisterhood is just so darn exhausted? We're diving deep into everything from those sneaky physical culprits, think iron levels playing hide and seek or a moody thyroid, to the mental weights of always being on and that sneaky urge to please everyone. And let's not forget society's oh-so-high bar that we're tirelessly trying to reach. I'm Dr. Sarah Vadboncar, your guide on this energy-finding mission. As a naturopathic doctor with over a decade of experience, I've been piecing together the fatigue puzzle, asking why so many incredible women around me, including my patients, often feel like they're running on empty. So pull up a chair or perhaps pop in your headphones and head out for a walk. Together we'll uncover those hidden, surprising, and sometimes even downright unexpected reasons behind that lingering tiredness. Ready to recharge those batteries? All right, deep breath. Let's jump into today's insightful episode. Welcome back. A few years ago, I was getting dressed for work and I put on a dress and I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, it's too short for work. And then that wise little, probably feminist voice in my head piped in and said, too short for who? And according to who? In the end, I changed out of that dress because I didn't want my patients to think I was unprofessional. And that's what we're exploring today on the one where your skirt is too short. A few months ago, I had the pleasure of speaking with our guest today. And when this idea of policing women's clothing came up, I knew it was a conversation I wanted to have on the podcast. My guest today is Ruthie Johnson. Ruthie is a holistic success coach, fitness junkie, and unapologetic feminist. She's worked with hundreds of women to stop sacrificing themselves, let go of stress and societal expectations, and step into what they're truly capable of with more freedom and ease. With a decade of experience across coaching, corporate consulting, and health and fitness with the qualifications to boot, her mission is to help create the next generation of female leaders who prioritize their well-being, create sustainable success with ease, and banish burnout for good. And that is why we clicked right away. Ruthie, welcome to the Fatigue Fixer podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I found that opening story so funny because I've had a similar experience, but it wasn't me. It was my manager at the time who told me that I needed to dress differently. Nothing wrong with my performance, but my clothes needed to be less provocative. And is that what got you interested? Like, where did your interest in this specific topic come up? Because I think it's such a fascinating thing to think about. Mm. I, To be honest, I feel like it's something that has been dictated to me the end, like my entire life. And I think the thing with it is even when I spoke to my mom and she would be like, you're embarrassing me by the way that you're dressing. Um, and just like this message that came through. And so often it, I don't actually think it's men. I think a lot of women, police women. And I think yes. this is obviously something that we can get into. And it was all part of like this patriarchal society that unfortunately we're still having to endure. Yes. And... I think from that point, like I find it very interesting because there are so many things about my my mum and my grandma which are unapologetically feminist. Like the way that they carried themselves, the things they did, the way that they spoke, how they weren't afraid to say what they think. And yet this policing of what we wear and women's bodies was still very much there. And how is that showing up now? Like, I, I think there's two parts to it that, I, that I'm thinking of. So one is the self-policing, which was I just mm-hmm. described, where you're getting ready to go somewhere and you put something on and then you question. And the word that keeps coming up is this word appropriate. Like, mm. what the hell does that even mean? Like, <laughs> you know, is this appropriate? Like, again, appropriate according mm-hmm. to who? Who yeah. is making these, like made up unwritten rules that we are all for the most part like blindly following so what is what does the policing look like like how do you see this show up 
either in like you described in your own uh, life, but also the women Mm. that you work with? So I find it really interesting because I think that this actually is something that happens as we get older, that we as a society, like there are so many cases of this, as a society, we glorify young women or girls. And if we don't look a certain way, then we shouldn't be owning that. Mm-hmm. And so for because me, God it, forbid yeah. that men cannot control themselves in our mm-hmm. present is kind I mean, of the, totally the <laughs> underlying message that I, it is, it's always our fault. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and I think it starts so young. Like you said, there was a case where I live here in Canada a couple of years ago of girls in a high school who were literally pulled out of class and made to bend over <sighs> in order for their, some school teacher to assess if their skirts were too short. Wow. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna like I'm gonna throw a trigger warning out there. <laughs> um, there's so much victim blaming, and so often when we hear about women who have been sexually assaulted, raped, it's like, well, what was she wearing? Yes, as and if I'm like, that makes any difference. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm just like, number one, like. If I think there's, there is this thing still in society where it's like women are objectified and coming back to this point of like young girls. And then once we get past a certain point, like I'm 32, once we get past a certain point, we're no good or we're mothers or like we have to fulfill a certain role in society. And actually that if we're not doing that, then like, what are we good for? It's like, we're not actually seen as people. So a lot of the time I worked in the corporate world and when that was going on, it was very much, it was very much an old boys club. And I never really experienced that until I'd walked into that environment. And then to also have to be thinking about what am I wearing and how am I showing up? And women are judged on a completely different standard to men. Like if if women are slightly overweight, it's like we're not good enough. If men are slightly overweight in a corporate world, it's actually seen as a sign of respect that they're actually working hard. I'm like, how is like how is this stuff filtered through so that we are looking at men and women completely differently? And actually, in these corporate worlds that are fill, filled with men, women aren't even seen as human. And I, I obviously we can talk about like interpersonal relationships, but when we're talking about in general, that thing is still playing out if we're objectifying women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember reading specifically what you just said, that when men are overweight, they are actually more respected. People think Mm -hmm. they're more capable. And I literally just wrote (laughs) down Hillary Clinton because I think she's one Mm -hmm. of the most classic cases of being, I would argue the most experienced ready person to become u.s mm-hmm. president and got torn apart because they didn't like her pantsuits right yeah we had something similar here in the uk actually where there was a whole thing about a woman who went into parliament in a certain outfit and she was going from work to an event and she was just dropping in i think she's dropping off like a laptop or something and on the news the next day it was like, this is inappropriate workwear for someone in the House of like the House of Commons. I was just like, this is bonkers. Because if you're showing up and you're doing a good job, I'm so grateful that I don't have to abide by rules. I think obviously there's a level of professionalism that I want to come across with and being very on brand. And yet, if I want to show up in a jumper and sweats, which I often do in my coaching calls because it's about being relaxed, then I can and I'm just waiting for the world to catch up. Now, I know it is. I know in a lot of startup spaces, a lot of women-owned businesses, that is already happening. And yet there is still this policing. And so I don't think it's just in the corporate world. I do think it is a societal thing, whether we're looking at women in bikinis over a certain age, um, whether we're thinking about women shouldn't be wearing mini skirts over a certain age, all the things. And it's like there's unwritten rules that we have to follow 
and no one actually knows what the rules are. <laughs> Right. It's so true. And there's like, they're a moving target, I think, depending Mm -hmm. on your age. And like you said, where you work. And I think going back to this idea of like appropriate according to who so much Mm -hmm. of this is predicated on the male gaze, right? Which is this Mm. idea that we are constantly being looked at and wanting to be seen in a positive light by men, even though we don't like, you don't walk out of your house probably in the morning saying, I hope men on the street find me attractive. It's not like that, but we are still to this day. So many of the things, especially in the way that we present ourselves is Mm -hmm. to meet this, like, again, this standard of what is appropriate and professional. And it seems like we can't really win because (laughs) We're we're supposed to be sexy, but not too much, right? We don't want to be seen as slutty because then, like you said, it invites all kinds of like, well, what did you expect to happen if you were wearing mm-hmm. that? So it's this, and this is why I wanted to talk about it because if you haven't made the connection yet, like it's exhausting trying to meet yes. these crazy criteria that, again, are probably not in your conscious mind, but that are absolutely influencing the decisions you make when you get dressed every day. Mm-hmm. I hear that on so many levels. And I just, I just feel like, how is this still happening in 2023? Mm-hmm. How? And because it's so unconscious, like the one thing I learned, the more I do my work and the more I support my clients is how pervasive the patriarchy and misogyny is and how everything is wrapped up in it. And it's almost like it's impossible to escape and very much like the patriarchy. Like let's, let's call it what it is. It supports white middle-class men and that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. It's it's, it's designed to do a job. It's a system. And that shuts down so many people whether whether you're a woman, whether you're of a racial background, whether you're not cis, hetero, whatever. And it's like we're, we're constantly trying to put people in boxes to make ourselves feel comfortable. And so, yes, a lot of that is then reflected back. And so often when I see myself and I see myself judging w- women who are like 18 and they're going out and they're having fun. I see myself even doing, I'm like, what is she wearing? Because Mm -hmm. it's so ingrained. And I see that projection of like, oh, that's me. That's my issue. It's got nothing to do with them. Like clearly they're body confident. Clearly they they feel good in what they're wearing. And so I'm seeing it change through the generations. But it all does come back to this idea of male gaze. Constantly. And coming back to that idea of being in a corporate world and being told that my clothes are too provocative, but my performance was fine. Right. I was just like, this is bonkers. And then when I changed, so I went from corporate into personal training, literally standing where I was like in like the gym entrance, waiting for my clients and the amount of men who would look me up and down as if I was an object. And I'm like, I'm not here for your entertainment. Right. So it is exhausting. I don't think it's just exhausting from the idea of like us trying to make ourselves acceptable, which women have been taught to do for generations. And it really locks into this idea of people pleasing. Mm -hmm. But there's that angle. And then there's the other angle, which is just when you're pissed off and you can't take it anymore. And you're just like, I'm done. And as soon as you see it, it's that's the angle. And that's exhausting as well. Yeah. And I think... That's the point where I I don't say I'm not going to say I'm there as if there's a there to get to, but mm-hmm. I'm so much more mindful of these made up rules. And this is just one. This is one of many, many made up rules of the patriarchy that I have been blindly following. And I've gotten to the point I'm 40. How old am I? 41. Um, where I almost like want to do things to rebel. Mm-hmm. Like. I'm like, I will not participate. Like I am consciously refusing almost to, as like a statement, whether 
anybody notices or not. But for me, it's really important <laughs> to be like, I will not participate in that. Like I'm mm-hmm. making an active decision to not participate in these made up clothing rules that we have mm. decided. And I want to unpack what you said about judging other women, because I think it's so true. And I think anyone who's honest will admit that we are very judgmental, especially towards other women. Why are like, what's going on there when we see a woman live in her best life, and it triggers something in us? What what's going on there? I mean, this is just my take, right? Yeah. And having worked with a lot of women, mm-hmm. and I have worked, I have also worked with men, and there is a, it's a different game. But with women, this judgment thing, or and especially when we get triggered by other women, this is my take, that we have been taught from a really young age that there is only room at the top for one. Mm-hmm. And so... It's like kill or be killed. Right. So if you see another woman succeeding in any way, Mm -hmm. I think especially if you see someone doing the things that you secretly want that you probably haven't given yourself full permission to acknowledge that you want, Mm -hmm. you're going to judge the shit out of that. Because there's some part of you that wishes deep down that you could wear that mini skirt to work or that you could dye your hair flaming pink or whatever you're seeing that's triggering this reaction. And I think that's really hard because I think when we see something and we judge, we think it's because there's a rejection, but it's always just mirroring something inside of you, in my experience, Mm -hmm. that needs to be explored. Yeah, I found it really interesting because I know that there's a lot of like skinny shaming and fit shaming. And I used to do bikini competitions. And so the amount of comments that I got about, oh yeah, you've gotten too small and oh, we need to fatten you up or whatever. And then I saw something yesterday and it was about a woman who's done, a young woman who's done really well in a mindful clothing brand. And they said that they were releasing plus sizes they're like really like body inclusive and someone had put in the comments skinny people and it's not like skinny people need to check themselves it's not fair they're stealing our sizes it's so disrespectful or something like that and it was just like what does that even mean (laughs) well also you don't know what's going on inside someone else's mind they may have body dysmorphia they may have all these other things going on it, it, but it was just like this, like such a reflection of, I can't have what they have. And so I'm going to judge the hell out of them because yep. that makes me feel better. And actually, if I've learned anything, I've learned that cutting down other women does, A, it does not support us all rising. And B, it doesn't make us feel good. No. And so I'm always like, if you want to kind of create that level for yourself, and this judgment is you seeing that, like, you unconsciously playing out a limit on someone else. Mm-hmm. So if you see someone else getting something that you want or having something that you want, you judging them to, is a surefire way of seeing that in, in your mind's eye, you don't think you can have that. Yeah. And so chances like, are can, you, yeah. you never will have it because uh-huh. you will not attract something that you judge. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. With that mindset, like, let's talk about the fact that that can be flipped. Yes. And so I'm always looking at, like, if I'm triggered, I'm like, what is going on? Like, Mm -hmm. what, like, where is this coming from? Maybe it is a projection. Maybe it is me being like, oh, this thing is playing out and it's actually mine. Or maybe it's triggering something on a deeper level. So, for instance, I was bullied as a kid. And so if someone says certain things to me, I'm like, like, not not around this. But if, if someone says something to me that I'm like... Uh, then I get really triggered so for me it's like right what's going on inside me so that I can shift and so I do think we're waking up more to this as a society but for a lot of women if we've been we've if we've been taught there's only room at the top for one person then it's like if someone's already there of course we're not going to believe that we can do it or that we can be the thing or we can dye our hair pink because how would we be seen? Like, how would we be rejected? Do we belong? Is it safe? And let's talk about the fact that for a lot of women, 
life does not feel very safe. Absolutely. And I also think there is there are so many examples of women who have risen to the top and they get cut down so publicly, so mm. viciously that it literally sends out like a warning signal to other women being like, be careful how high you climb, mm -hmm. which I Huge. think is, it, it's really, really sad. And it's completely unconscious. So it's right. not like it's something that's on the mental level. It's all on mm -hmm. our nervous system. And when we talk about like nervous system and our mind, our mind actually isn't, our mind is incredibly powerful, but actually those blocks are stored within your body. And so if that's going into your nervous system and that's getting stored, of course, that's going to be difficult to shift because at least 90% of our actions come from the body. And I think most of us have never learned how to sit with discomfort, mm -hmm. right? We've never learned to sit with jealousy or envy or anger or fear. And mm. so instead of feeling that and being like, huh, that's curious. Like, I wonder what that's about. We, a lot of times we either lash out with judgment or we try to numb and get rid of it. And that's where <laughs> we, social media, alcohol, <laughs> online shopping, all the things that are so widely of food, so easy to get those like unpleasant things to, yeah. and to kind of not be mid, felt. Yeah. And we're also in the middle of a pandemic of women being or even an epidemic of women being really sick because mm -hmm. we're storing all of that energy. And I know that's something that you work with in terms yes. of like helping people be super healthy, but anger has so many, has been linked to so many chronic conditions. And so if we're not processing this emotion and that's getting stuck in our body, not only is that keeping us stuck and it's exhausting, but actually it can really damage our sense of self-worth and it can cause so many issues down the line. And so I, I'm really stepping in at the moment to speaking my truth, whether people like it or not, yes. and really having the conversations that matter rather than trying to run away from them. And I see it so often with people trying to numb out rather than actually feeling their feelings. And it just keeps you stuck in a loop. And so for me, one of the most empowering things you can do is actually just feel the damn thing and breathe into it and like, let it be because a lot of the time when women are called irrational, it's because we've been taught that we can't be emotional mm -hmm. and emotions aren't bad, but if we bottle them up, of course they're going to explode. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And the other thing is that if you actually learn to sit in discomfort, you will realize that most of those unpleasant emotions actually don't last very long when you let them go through you. They actually feel so much worse and last longer when you're actively trying to not feel them. Yeah. I mean, the studies say 90 seconds. Yes, exactly. If you sit with an emotion and yep. I'm just like, it blows my mind because I'll do five mm -hmm. hours of overwhelm and then I'll drop in for 90 seconds and I'm like, it's gone. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Why have I been stressing out for five hours? <laughs> It's true. So how do we drop in? How do you, do you have any like specific practices that you teach or that you use? If a woman is like feeling that and wants to actually feel it, how do we, how would we start to do that? I feel like the best thing for me personally, I have two and okay. one is more active and one is kind of more passive. But mm -hmm. if it's like you're, it's literally in the moment and like come back to the breath mm -hmm. and just breathe. I mean, you're breathing anyway. You might as well use it. Yes. So just breathing in, letting it sit wherever the sensation is. Often we have labeled emotions. And so we run after the good ones and we mm -hmm. try and stay away from the bad ones. And actually anxiety and excitement are the same thing, yeah. just labeled differently. And exactly. so if we're in that kind of chasing, of course, we're never actually going to find true happiness. And there is no such thing as a bad emotion. They just are. It's all feedback. And when we learn not to take it personally, that's when everything shifts. So when we can look at things without the label, without a story and be like, okay, I feel it in my stomach, in my heart, in my throat, in my hands, in my shoulders, in my face, and just breathing into that sensation only for 90 seconds. Sometimes it's only 30. Mm -hmm. Then not only do you feel better, but you have more clarity around the situation. And actually it's so much easier to make a clear decision 
like a yes, no, how am I going to handle this when you're not running from whatever's going on in your body? Yeah. So that's the first one. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) And the second one for me is movement. Because I'm like, when I'm walking, when I'm in the gym, when I'm doing things, I'm less in my head and I'm more in my body because I'm focusing on it. And that in itself feels more empowering. And so when we're talking about body confidence and body policing, I'm like, do you know what? Like, I don't, I don't feel like I need all this external stuff. And to be honest, I went through a phase when I was bikini competing, when I actually had a breakdown because I got so much male attention and I wasn't used to it. And I was like, I can't take it. Like, I don't like being objectified this way. It's too much. Like the fact that people aren't seeing me for me and I'm being either judged one way or another. So for me, I'm like fitness. Yes. Great. All about kind of supporting your body. And for me, it's more of a mental empowerment tool and coming Mm -hmm. back to myself. Yeah. And I wrote down the word embodiment. You're literally coming back Mm -hmm. into your body because most women, and I don't know if you see this with the women you work with, like we're so cerebral, we're so stuck in our heads. And again, you said it, our brains are big, beautiful, amazing things, but there is such power in tuning back into your body because that's where I would argue like the the real or truer answers often are in the Mm -hmm. body. And you, your breath is the fastest way to shift your state and to like reconnect with it. So I love that you said that. Um, the other thing I would love to talk about is more around like bodies and movement. Cause I know you're a, mm-hmm. a fitness junkie, you know, you've got your personal <laughs> training and this is another place where I think so many women are trying to use fitness as a way to meet this standard of what a body Mm -hmm. is supposed to look like. And I think we've completely lost so many of the other joys and like benefits of movement that have nothing to do with weight loss and body changing. But I think because so many women, if they're not seeing those results, they get like unmotivated or they kind of lose their their joy of moving their bodies Mm -hmm. so how do you find movement to be a practice that you kind of like encourage your clients to to adopt or is it something you encourage them to do yes it is to answer that question and my journey has been like around this has been like a whole other thing and so I work with highly ambitious women who are like sick and fed up of fawning, people pleasing, like want more, but are sacrificing themselves, never have time for themselves. And so a lot of my clients really struggle with this idea of like, I don't have time. And I'm like, what that tells me is that you don't think of yourself as a high priority. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing any of this stuff for like in your life, who is it for? And I'm just like, like, to me, that makes so much sense, but it's because I've had to really think about it. And so my journey, I used to swim competitively. So I was swimming eight times a week, doing galas on the weekend. And that, yeah, crazy life. And then I also used to do netball or hockey on top and I was diving. So I was like a very, very sporty kid. And then I quit swimming. I piled on weight so quickly. And the comment that my mom kept repeating to me was, you're putting on weight. You're like, you're getting bigger because I was burning five to six to 7,000 calories a day to not doing that. And I just, I was 14 at the time. Like I had no idea about these shifts. And so I had an eating disorder for a very long time. And so when we talk about like rock bottom self-worth, self-confidence and being like so attached to how you look in your body, like I've been there and I get it like on such a deep level and one of the most healing things for me was my mum passed away four years ago. I ended up in the relationship with the guy that I am now, and it's been four years, and he knew everything that was going on. And I just turned to him about six months in and was like, my eating disorder is really bad at the moment. And he just went 
and he didn't know like he didn't know any of this was going on we don't even know relationship six months and he turned around and was like do you know what I love you anyway and if you need to talk about it like I'm here and I accept you and for me I was like this is the first time anyone has ever just like loved on me and just been so compassionate and accepting of where I'm at and overnight for me it was like it was gone Wow. because I was just like the presence of love mm-hmm. and he was such a mirror for me at the point like the presence of love and the presence of like being in that and loving yourself shifts everything and from that moment like that has really kind of solidified for me and I've also had times throughout like the past I would say 20 years where if I've had a tough time, if I had an accounting exam, I would go to the gym because I'm like, I need to move my body and I'm so in my head and I'm overthinking and I'd come out of the classes that were ridiculously tough and be like, well, if I can do that, I can do anything. Or when I was working 70 to 80 hour weeks and I was like, I need the mental space, which is how I actually shifted from corporate into personal training because I was like, I actually am not lit up by numbers and consulting. I actually love being in a gym and being in my body. And so like, if we want to talk about the benefits, I mean, mental health is huge. And we're in the middle of a mental health epidemic. Like, despite having all this information, people are sicker than ever. Mm-hmm. And there's more stress than ever. So I'm like, it's not an information thing. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's all this other stuff. So mental health is huge. I think for women, actually learning how to empower themselves and feel strong in their bodies is another huge thing clarity for me is massive because I get all my best downloads when I'm either walking or Same. at the gym or in Same. the shower mm-hmm. it's like it's just reconnecting to ourselves and so a lot of these problems that we have in current day life I'm like well it would really be solved if we actually just number one accepted ourselves number two we're just more in our bodies and the other thing just to add on is like we always talk about women's intuition and like the wisdom Mm -hmm. and I'm like that does not happen in our in our minds it is all down down in the body down in the heart and there's so much research to um to prove that actually our hearts react quicker than our brains so if we're not in our bodies we're completely ignoring all the wisdom that's stored there yes thank you for bringing that up that's something I talk about all the time Mm. so I'm glad you brought it up I want to touch on this idea that you talked about this like low self-worth and for you it wasn't until your partner said like I accept you no matter what that it sounds like you were able to do that for yourself Mm. and I think that is like I've had a a journey with my own body where I was always in a slightly not huge body but always just slightly bigger than what had been like socially desirable um And it took me such a long time. I think I was probably in my late 20s or early 30s when I finally just decided like I could spend the rest of my life trying to shrink myself or I could take that energy and I can direct it towards just accepting my body as it is. And that Mm -hmm. I decided to just accept my body. And I'm so glad I did because it's such a liberation of your attention and your energy mm. when you are not constantly focused on your body and your appearance and trying to change it. Because the other thing I wrote down is that when your self-esteem or your self-worth is low, I think we're much more likely to try to conform because we don't have the confidence to show up authentically Mm -hmm. And some of the ways in which we conform is certainly in terms of the the dressing, which is what we've been talking about, how we literally dress ourselves. But the other way we conform is through people pleasing. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to bring up, which I asked you in advance (laughs) that you're okay to talk about this. So this interview was originally scheduled to happen last week. And on the day that we were set to record, you were not feeling well. And you sent me a voice note to say, I'm not feeling well, and I didn't get it on time. And we kind of opened up the call. And do you remember what you said when you came on? I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) You said something along the lines of my people pleasing is kicking in really hard right now. Mm -hmm. Because I think you felt really bad. And I'll let you say how you felt. But it's what I got the impression that you felt bad that you were potentially like letting me or letting us down by not being able to do the podcast. 
So can you tell huge. me a little bit more? Like, <laughs> tell me what, what was coming up on that day for you? Yeah, that was huge for me. And I have done a lot of work around people pleasing. And especially with my family, it's something that I have to, had to work really hard with. And I think for me, it's like, I'm someone who loves to stick by commitments. And I don't know if this is something that your clients resonate with, but for me, it's like, I don't like letting people down. Mm -hmm. And especially in a coaching space, I'm like, I feel like I have like duties to uphold. And so we can talk about it in like a professional sense, but it also plays out at home. It's like, what, like, what have I said I'm going to do? And have I said, have I shown up for it? And so Last week, I was not feeling remotely well. I, I literally went to bed straight after the call. And I was like, I felt like I was getting sick, like super sick. And then I woke up on Friday and was like, you know what's the best thing that I did was just go and do nothing for like seven hours. And from that point, I was like, right, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is about me drawing back. And so I don't necessarily think for me, it was a, like an overcommitment, but I do see how this plays in so much to people pleasing. And it's like really overfilling your plate with things to do. It's like putting everyone else in front of you. As I said, like this idea that women aren't a priority and we don't make ourselves a priority. And then we say we don't have time because we've got so many commitments. And actually, when we learn to protect our energy, I've had a really, it's really interesting that we're having this conversation right now because I've had a week where a lot of people have been asking for my time. And there's been a lot of pushback from me because we're moving on Saturday and it's been phrased in such a way I can see where my being like, Oh yeah, I could have jumped on a call with this person or I could have done this for that person. And I could have supported someone else here. And actually being able to communicate that in a way, which is like, I'm really valuing my time right now. I want to have to protect my energy. And I'm also noticing that I have a tendency to overgive the Instead of just being like, no, like F off, can't, I can't deal with you. <laughs> For me, it's like people have been so receptive to it more than I thought they would for me speaking my truth. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk about the fact that women have been taught to please and men have been taught to lead or to win. Yes. And that we're kind of like these, these homemakers and let's like, let's be real a lot of the stuff that we are dealing with now as women has only really come to light in the past hundred years. So there's a lot of epigenetic stuff that's been passed down. There's a lot of this fawn response, a lot of functional freeze where we don't speak our truth. We don't say the thing. And actually that dishonesty then stays in our bodies coming back to the idea of like us trapping this energy. And so the more that I realize that I don't need to people please actually the more I I'm respecting myself and I see that mirrored in other people because you were so gracious about it. It was like, no, like I'm all about like people taking time. And I was so blown away by that because it's not something that I've, I've experienced a lot of in my life of people just being like, yeah, no, it's fine. And like, I have the best clients. They're all like that. But previously or in other situations, that's not really been played out for me. And I think that's what makes it so hard to Mm. say, no, I can't do it. Because a lot of times the response you get is not positive. Um, but part of why I think this is so important and part of why I respond that way is because I also think that not to add another responsibility, but I also look at this, that when I set boundaries and I honor my own needs and wants, I'm also modeling that for other women. And especially as you're a coach, I'm a naturopathic doctor, like, Women are observing and watching what we're doing. And so it's also a perfect time to set an example. And if we all just mm. start honoring ourselves, it won't be so weird. It won't be so uncomfortable. <laughs> but when you feel like you're the only one doing it, it does feel so risky and so uncomfortable because we are so afraid of what other people will think. And I think the reason we're so uncomfortable is that we are so unwilling to let other people down, and yet we are so quick to let ourselves down. Coming back to this idea of no time, we're all busy, and some people are full of things that they need to do. But again, if we looked at all the things you did in a day, you probably were doing all the things that were expected 
of you by other people, you're probably getting those done. But when you set a goal for yourself or you set something, you you make a commitment to yourself, we're actually just so much more likely to be like, oh, well, ran out of time. That one's not as important. Yeah. And then we wonder why we're not feeling super happy and fulfilled and why we're, you know, getting sick. It's a real problem. And I actually yeah. look at a lot of this stuff in terms of boundaries and people pleasing and uh, women really cl- claiming themselves. Like I was having a chat with one of my clients earlier and it was so interesting because I can see exactly where she shines and the work that she wants to do in the world. And she wasn't claiming it. And I was like, no wonder your business feels all over the place and you're doing all these things, but actually not like really claiming it. So for me, I'm like, the more we do the boundary work, the energetic boundaries, I also believe the stronger our inner boundaries are, the less outer boundaries we need because mm. it's like, what's what's yours? What's mine? And so- Can you talk time, more about that? What do you mean by inner boundaries versus outer? So a really good example, because we're filming this around Christmas, is family drama. Uh-huh. And so if someone will say something and you get triggered or they, they, they say, you make me feel or you made me do. And so there's this blame that's like shifted and blame is so toxic. And so when we actually learn to discern what's ours and what's someone else's, we're like, actually, no, I feel clean about that. Like that's, that's not my stuff to hold on to. And then you're like, yeah, I can just get on with my day rather than holding it and mulling it over, overthinking it and sticking. And also if someone's asking for something from me, I'm like, well, actually, how, like, is this my issue? And is this something I have space for? Or do I need to stay in my own lane right now? And how is that aligning? Because if I'm going to get resentful over it, then Mm -hmm. there's no point me doing it. That doesn't serve that relationship. Yes. And I think that's such a good reframe because so many times we say yes, because we're trying to avoid the discomfort of no. And then we do, we end up, number one, we end up suffering because now you're dreading the whole lead up to the thing that you said yes to that you don't want to do. And then when you're there, you're resentful. And I'm like, I don't want anyone in my space who's there feeling resentful. I would rather that they not be there at all. And I think if we just looked at it from that perspective, it might make it a little bit easier to say, no, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. And I do see it's very interesting because I went to an event last week. There is an expectation put on women, even in work, to do the, the soft things like running the parties or doing like the extra that no one pays you for like none of these things are promotable but there's still this expectation it's the same in um so I come from a Christian background the same in church men are taught to lead women are taught to serve and Mm -hmm. actually we need to start looking at this in a different dynamic because as we're waking up to the fact that we like the patriarchy does like serves no one like literally Mm -hmm. no one Mm -hmm. even men Like we can nope. talk about male suicide rates. Yeah. When we're, as we learn that we need a different way, and this is kind of what some people call a more feminine approach or a more emotional approach or more embodied approach. As we lean into that, things are going to shift and it's happening slowly. But for me, I'm like, when, when I'm looking at things, when I'm claiming back kind of my energy and less in this doing frame but more in this being frame and less in my head and more in my body then it's like that's where my real power is Mm -hmm. and actually coming back to this idea of like policing our bodies when we're in our being like our soul being the energy that you hold is completely different completely transformational and that's what people are really looking for coming back to this idea of like conforming because of self-worth I'm like well actually if we know ourselves deeply and we know what we're capable of and we feel authentic then it actually doesn't matter whether you you tie up in a pantsuit some jeans tracksuit bottoms a mini skirt a bikini it doesn't really matter as long as we know ourselves yeah yeah and because you're radiating confidence from an inside place not because of the clothing on your body so 
if we want, and I love that you're wanting to like create the next generation of female leaders, because this is, this is why I'm so passionate about fatigue, because I think fatigue is something that holds so many female leaders back that we are not stepping into our full power because we are so tired. So if we're going to kind of help reduce or fix our fatigue in this one little slice of our life around this policing of our clothing and policing of our bodies, what are some of the first things that are first steps that we can take or, you know, things to think about that might help us detach a little bit mm-hmm. from this need to conform when it comes to our clothing? I feel like it's twofold. So there's obviously us and there's other people. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big things is that when we are scared of other people's judgment, seeing that as our own, I'm really questioning that. So is it like, for instance, is it true that I know someone's going to respond a certain way? Is it true that this is going to happen? Is it, is it true that they are going to think this? And even if they do, is that, does that mean actually mean anything about me or is that their stuff? Exactly. And so on that, that kind of second point, boundaries and like energetic, deep energetic boundaries, knowing yourself, feeling fully in alignment and feeling fully authentic. And that takes work. Like I'll be re- really honest and open about it. It's not like someday some light bulb comes on. Sometimes there's some deep, deep excavation work that needs to happen, which is why I really really love transformational work because I think it's so powerful you can have all the strategy in the world and have all the tips and all the tricks but if you're not doing this deeper work things get stuck and so for me for my clients I'm like yes we can talk about strategy actually most of the time we're talking about blogs and so when we talk about kind of energetic boundaries it's like what what do I want how do I feel in my clothes what makes what lights me up where do I feel sexy not to do with men, but where do I really feel sexy? Where do I love myself most? Yeah. And then from that place, like anything's possible. I love that. And I would just add to that is also, and this goes back to episode one, wear clothes that actually fit your current body. Because this is another way we police ourselves. We're trying to jam ourselves into clothing from 10 years ago that is made for a body that we don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's like a constant, literal digging in your flesh reminder that your body has changed. So let's also not police ourselves by wearing clothing that doesn't fit us anymore. Or judging ourselves for not fitting into the things we didn't used to. Thank you. Yes. We used to. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you, Ruthie. This was such an enlightening conversation. And I'm <laughs> I'm sure we're going to hear from our listeners about this because it is such a, a subtle but pervasive thing that we are doing to ourselves and to each other. And I think if we can, again, you know, the reason I started this podcast is I really want to shine a light on all the different ways that we are leaking energy and that our energy is going into places that are not aligned with our deep needs and desires. And I think this is like one of those perfect examples. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and you can, I will link Ruthie's uh, Instagram. You can go and follow her there and learn more about all her work because she's doing some incredible work in the world. So thank you, Ruthie, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Bye, everybody. We'll see you back in a couple weeks. Thanks for spending your precious time with me today. Remember, it takes a village or a podcast community to really make a dent in this fatigue epidemic. If today's episode resonated with you, do me a favor. Share it with a friend or two, and if you have a second, drop us that shiny five-star review. It means so much to me. Are you eager to solve your own personal energy puzzle? Hop on over to fatiguefixer.ca forward slash quiz and check out my fatigue fingerprint quiz. Let's pinpoint what's standing between you and feeling your best. A big thank you to Jen Hudson and Drew Gardner over at Story Studio Network for bringing these conversations to life. And hey, just so you know, I've got your back. Your fatigue 
It's super real and it's definitely not just all in your mind. I see you and I believe you. Every two weeks, we'll keep these heart to hearts going, learning together and cheering each other on. Because between you and me, accepting perpetual exhaustion as the norm, that's not gonna fly around here. See you back here in two weeks. Bye.